Okay. All right. Thanks everyone for coming. Today we have Tori Noquez talking about magic and math. Next week we have Julia Finkelstein. He's going to talk about the stable marriage problem. But now let's sit back and have some magic. Mm. <laughs> Okay. Hey guys, um, so we're going to talk about math for a while first, which I feel like Giannis didn't make clear. So, <laughs> <laughs> alright, so um, if you guys read the little description, I'm going to talk about counting for a while and a little bit of probability, and then we're going to see a demonstration with some cards, which are a good way to uh, demonstrate that. Okay, so um, we're going to start off really basic. I know a lot of you um, aren't necessarily familiar with principles of counting, so I'm going to... Uh, Start, um, start real small. So, all right, let's start with this. So the rule of um, product, not to be confused with the product rule of calculus, um, also known as the fundamental principle of counting, is the idea that if there are A ways to do one thing and B ways to do another thing, that there are A times B ways of doing both things, right? And this is something we do in everyday, like, figuring stuff out, right? So more generally, um, if you want to know the number of ways to do an n-step process, you just take the product of the number of ways to do each step. So number of ways to do step one, etc., all the way up to n. and think about why this makes sense. And this is a type of problem that you've probably all seen on like, I don't know, standardized tests maybe? But it's like this uh, number of outfits problem, right? Have you guys seen this sort of thing? So if I say that I have like, um, I don't know, blue, white, and black shirts, and maybe gray and khaki pants, and I don't know, what kind of shoes do we have? Boots and flip flops. Then I wanna know how many possible outfits. So a naive way to approach this, um, this question is just to build a little tree of the possible outcomes, right? So I can say at the beginning, I wanna choose a shirt. So there are three possible choices. Um, for that, the three point I pick. Man, my wardrobe is so boring. Okay, <laughs> blue, white, and black shirts. So that's the first, uh, the first uh, step for choosing the shirt color. And then given that step, given that I've completed that step of my process, then I wanna do the next step, which is choosing a pair of pants. So either that's, so for each of these, that gives me two choices of either gray or khaki. So this is the choosing pants step. Okay, and then the last step, right, now that given that I've chosen a shirt and chosen a pair of pants, I need to choose a pair of shoes. So this was this, um, man, I didn't lay this very well. Okay. And so the last step is shoes, and that's flip-flops or boots, right? So for each of these, that gives me two choices. Okay. All right, so given this, uh, this little tree, right, any branch through the tree gives me a combination of choices that will give me an outfit, right? So if I like follow this branch through the tree, that gives me a black shirt with gray pants and flip-flops, for example. So at the end, you can count up all the sort of terminal nodes on this tree and see how many possible combinations that gives us, right? So in this case, if you count these up, there's 12 of them, right? But why are there 12 of them? Because at each stage, for everything in the previous stage, we have the number of things in the next stage. So rather than drawing out this whole ugly tree, we could just use this rule of product principle and say, okay, there are three ways to do the first step to choose a shirt, times two, times two, for a total of 12. Okay, makes sense so far? It's a reasonably straightforward concept that we all use in everyday stuff, but we wanna make it explicit because we're gonna be using it um, more Technically. Okay. Uh, all right, I guess we have a little text for this. Okay, so with that in mind,
mind, um, let's talk about permutations. Okay, and then this is kind of an important distinction. Um, without repetition, we're not really going to talk about when there is repetition. Um, I'll mention what that means in a second. Um, okay, so permutations are about uh, answering um, questions uh, about choosing objects in a particular order, or choosing people, or numbers, or I guess objects was the right way to say that. Okay, so questions like this. So how many three-digit numbers are there? Um, with digits in, let's leave out zero because that gives us some weird numbers. So in one through nine, such that all three digits are different. So uh, let's just talk for a second about what we mean, right? So we mean three-digit numbers with digits in one through nine, so there's no zeros in our, in our number. And, um, and so the order matters, and what I mean by that is that one, two, three is a different number than two, one, three, right? So that's what we're counting up is the number of different ones of those. Um, and when we say uh, without replacement, what we mean is this thing that all the digits are different. So we can't have something like 331 where 3 is used twice. Okay, so we want to think of a way to count this up. So we're going to use this, this rule, rule of product that we just talked about. So if you think of your three digit number, um, picking it out as having three steps, right? So um, for the first step, there are nine possible choices that we can put in this digit, right? We can pick anything from one to nine. Okay. And then for the second step, because we're not allowed to repeat anything, right? All the digits have to be different. One of these guys is out of the running. Whatever we picked for the first step is no longer in the running. So it means that there are eight ways to choose this digit. Okay, excellent so far. So how many ways are there to choose the third digit now that two of them are out of the running? Seven. 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 Correct. Okay, so the number of ways, we just remember you multiply the steps. So this is, I don't know, I should anybody got this? Anyone do this in their head? None of you guys, room full of math majors. That's good. Okay, doesn't matter. It's nine times eight times seven, whatever number this is, is the number of three digit numbers um, with digits from one to nine such that all three digits are different. Okay, so let's talk about this for a little bit um, because formulating this in this way, saying like, okay, take the number of things you're choosing from and multiply the numbers down to however many you're trying to choose. It's kind of a complicated thing to say. So um, to the rescue, so that we can like write a formula for this, is the factorial function. All right, so by n factorial, what we mean is the product of all the stuff, all the, all the stuff, all the, for an integer, well, for a non-negative integer n, it means the product of all the integers down to one. So the sort of general format looks like this. So for example, if we wanted five factorial, um, this is five times four times three times two times one, okay? And then as a, as a convention, we say that zero factorial is one. And we'll see why this matters in a little while, but don't worry too much about it. Okay, so like we said, we want a convenient way to um, formulate this concept of how we're, um, counting this stuff up. So um, what we do here is uh, throw in some more numbers. So we want this to look like a factorial. So let's multiply the rest of the numbers down to one. But we can't just like throw those in there. So we've got to divide by them to keep this the same. OK? So this is the same as what we've just calculated. But the reason this is convenient is that we see the two pieces of information that we're interested in kind of show up here. So if we let n be the total number of things, and r be um, the number we want to, the number 
of things we'd like to choose. And again, we're still handling the case when they're in order. Then what is this? This is we can write this as n factorial over n minus r factorial. Because the idea is that um, we want to start at n and start multiplying down, but we want to stop after we have our r things. So by dividing by n minus r factorial, it lobs off the rest of this part of the factorial in the numerator. Any questions so far? Is this reasonably clear to you guys? Okay, good. All right. Um, Okay, so uh, let's look at how we're gonna use this to uh, look at things where the order doesn't matter. Um, actually, no, I wanna do one more example of this. Um, okay, let's see. All right. So I'm gonna leave that there. Okay, so the formula was n factorial over n minus r. So let's look at one more example of this, of things where the order matters. So um, let's do something like this. So in, okay. um, in a 15 person club, how many ways can we choose a president, vice president, and secretary. Okay, so this is a case where the order matters, right? So if I were to choose my three people and I said, okay, Will and Jonathan and Edgar are going to be this president, vice president, and secretary in that order, that's different than if I made Edgar the president and Jonathan the vice president and Will the secretary, right? So these are two different situations and we want to count them separately. So this is why we think of this as the order mattering. So in light of this formula, we can just work it out, right? So this is going to be, um, so it's going to be 15 factorial over 15 minus three factorial, right? Which you can work out. I, I didn't figure that out ahead of time. Anyway, it's some number. Um, but this is, this is a way we can just apply this formula without thinking through drawing the little dashes for president, vice president, um, secretary and then multiply 15 times 14 times 13, which in this case would not be that laborious, but when these numbers start getting bigger, that's a, that's a harder thing to, to work out in, in full detail. Okay, so I brought this example up because I kind of want to use it as a springboard to talk about um, combinations, which I guess I'll do it here. Okay, so um, all right, so let's talk about combinations. And this is also without, I guess I wrote repetition for without replacement is another way to phrase that. Um, which again, like in the number of examples that you can't re repeat the same digit, um, the analogous thing here would be you can't pick the same person for president and vice president or something like this. Okay, um, so combinations, are where the order does not matter. Okay? So, right, we're in order there. Right, so, um, so this is a different, different kind of thing. So let's ask a, a similar question to the one we have here. So this would be <coughs> something like, um, in our 15 person club, same club, how many ways uh, can we choose a three-person committee? Okay, so this is what I was talking about with the president, vice president, secretary thing. Now if I'm choosing a three-person committee, if I choose Will, Jonathan, and Edgar, or Edgar, Will, and Jonathan, that's the same committee. Right, so the order doesn't matter. We don't want to count that twice. Um, so let's talk about a way we can derive, um, bless you, derive a formula for this. Um, many, some, many, lots of you, I don't know. Some of you guys probably know. It's just the choose function. But we're going to talk about how to use this to get what that's going to look like. Okay. Um, oh, I didn't leave a lot of room. Okay. Uh, I guess we'll start here. Uh, all right. So let's look at this as a two-step process. Okay, because remember we have this rule of product where 
for the number of ways to do our process, we can multiply the number of steps. So let's look at this as, so step one as choose a three person committee. Okay, oops. All right, and we don't know how many ways we can do that yet. Let's just call that C. All right, and then step two, among those three people, choose the president, vice president, and whatever, secretary. Okay, so this is equivalent to choosing in order your president, vice president, and secretary, but it's just breaking it into two steps. You pick your three people first, and then you divvy them up into who's going to do what. Okay, um, so we'll talk about how to calculate this in one second, but the point is that because this is calculating the same process, if we multiply the number of ways to do step one times the number of ways to do step two, that will give us this number that we already found. Okay, make sense so far? All right, so um, talk about the number of ways to do, well, okay, so yeah, we don't know the number of ways to do this. This is what we're interested in finding. So let's talk about this. So what, are, what is the situation here? We've narrowed this down to saying we have three people and we want to choose all three of them in order, right? We want to choose one of them to be president, one of them to be vice president, one of them to be secretary, right? So this is, this is the same question as what we're asking here. We have a number of people and we want to choose a number of them in some particular order. So in this case, we'll use a permutation because the order matters. And in the N is going to be three and R is also going to be three. We're using all three people. Okay, so if we put this into our formula, what is it? It's three factorial over three minus three factorial, which that looks a little dangerous because it kind of looks like we're dividing by zero, but this is why I brought up, it's actually zero factorial, right? So, which we mentioned in the convention, it's that zero factorial is equal to one. So this is just three factorial over one factorial, which is three factorial. Okay, makes sense so far. So what we can do is that this is what we just said, that we can use this rule of product to say that uh, the product of the number of ways to do this step times the number of ways to do this step will give us the total number of ways. So if we come over to this thing, we can say this is equal to C, which is what we're trying to find, times three factorial. So then if we take this and solve for C, we just get 15 factorial over 15 minus three, which you'll notice I didn't simplify, factorial over three factorial. And this is, I mean, I did this with particular numbers in the example, but um, you can generalize this to starting with n things and being interested in choosing r things with the order not mattering. The same process explains why this is what we call the choose function, which we usually write with parentheses like, like that. Okay, any questions about that thing? No? All right, cool. Okay, um, all right, so with that in mind, uh, Let's, let's do another example. So I'm gonna, hmm, yeah, I'm gonna erase all of this. Okay. Okay, so this choose function. Um, where n is, again, the total number of things. and R is the number of things to be chosen. And again, this is when the order doesn't matter. Okay, so we just saw an example of a place where the order doesn't matter, like choosing a committee of people where each member of the committee has an equivalent role. Um, another place where the order doesn't matter is in choosing or dealing a hand of playing cards. So um, let's let's look at an example of how to use this choose function to calculate something with cards. So we could ask this question, which okay, how many ways? I'm gonna, uh, can four cards be chosen? 
from a deck of 52. Um, I guess I'm assuming some familiarity with playing cards. Um, there's 52 of them. But that's actually pretty much all you guys need to know. They're all different. Okay, so um, we can, so when we say choose four cards, right, the order doesn't matter. If I, if I choose them in one order and shuffle them in my hand, it's still the same four cards. Um, so we'll be using this, this function to calculate this. Um, so you can just plug it in, right? This is going to be 52 choose four, which I'm going to write a few different ways. So this is 52 factorial over four factorial, I guess I'll write it out. There's, well, no, I'm not. Okay, so times 52 minus four, which is 48 factorial. Okay, which we'll leave it like that um, for now. But if you were to work this out, and we're going to see this in a second, a lot of this is going to cancel, right? So if you're not familiar with factorials and choose functions and cancel and stuff, um, think about why this makes sense. That if you have 52 factorial on the top, that if you start writing these out, once you get to 48, down to 1, right, that stuff's going to show up in the bottom. So you've got this 4 factorial here. And then 48 factorial, so that's 48 down to 1. So everything after 48 is going to cancel. Okay, so what you're left with is 52 times 51 times 50 times 49 over 4 times 3 times 2 times 1, uh, which it turns out is equal, which I did on a calculator earlier, uh, 270,725. Okay, so that's a lot of different four-card hands. Um, okay, all right, so there's that. All right, so um, let's start uh, talking about probability. Um, and this is just going to be an incredibly naive approach to probability. Um, so when we're calculating the probability of something, especially something in everyday life that we kind of do um, in our heads, what are we doing? We're saying, what is the number of ways to get a special outcome over the total number of outcomes. So of course the smallest example of something like this would be um, like flipping a coin for example. So the like if your special outcome is that you want to get heads and um, the total number of outcomes is that it could be heads or tails, there's one way to get the outcome you're interested in and two possible outcomes. The probability of that is one over two, right? This is not anything anybody hasn't thought about before, I hope. Okay, so we can ask um, a slightly more interesting question, something like, um, what is the probability of correctly guessing a randomly selected card. Okay, so again, there's not much calculation to do. Correctly guessing, there's one way to correctly guess once the card is selected, right? So that's one over the previously mentioned 52 possible, possible playing cards, right? So I, um, I mentioned that I hope you guys are all familiar with playing cards, but in case you're not, here's what they look like. Um, so we have this deck of 52 bicycle cards. Um, they're all different. All right. What is your name? Mason. Mason. I'm Tori. It's nice to meet you. All right. Mason, if I could please have you pick a card. Any card you want. That one? All right. If I could have you look at it and show it to everybody in the room who is not, not me. Yeah, is it the uh, Ten of Diamonds? Yes. Right, okay, so the probability of that was 1 out of 52, which is approximately 1.9%. Okay, so that's, like, not totally impossible. <laughs> no, what? What? No, they're not, they're, they're all different. Is that what you asked? <laughs> okay. No, I, I thought of that. All right. <laughs> Return that. Blake, you're in my class. Thank you for coming. You're welcome. If I could have you, please. Here you are. Uh, okay. An important decision. So. Yeah. Oh? Mm -hmm. You sure? Yep. Okay. Now, Blake, if you could show your card around. <laughs> All right. Never make sure everybody sees it except for me. 
Let me know when you're done doing that. We're so done. You're done. Everybody's feeling good about... Okay. Blake, do you know how to shuffle cards? Yeah. Okay, I'm going to give you the rest of the deck and I want you to shuffle them in there. Okay. Okay? Or shuffle them together. Shuffle it in there. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um... Okay, so we're going to calculate a slightly more interesting probability, um, which requires some use of this choose function that we get to uh, develop while Blake shuffles the cards. So, what I want to know is, what is the probability? Probability that um, four selected cards, or yeah, I guess. Contain Blake's card. All right. So how can we calculate this? Well, what do we want? We want the number of ways for this thing that we're interested in to happen divided by the number of possible outcomes. Now, the number of possible outcomes we've already calculated, right? It was this thing. Um, it was the 52 choose 4. Right? So, um, now what we need to count is the number of possible four card hands, which include Blake's card. Okay, so let's go ahead and do that. So we've got our four, four card hand, and again, order doesn't really matter. But let's say this is maybe Blake's card. Um, okay, so we need to count how many ways we can possibly choose these three other cards, right? Um, so what do we have? Blake's chosen card is out of the running. Right? So how many total cards can we choose from? There's 51 of them left, right? And then we're choosing three of them, and again, order doesn't matter. So this is the number of ways that we can have this situation. Okay, but we're interested in calculating the probability, which is why I left this uh, variation up here, okay? So let's, uh, let's go ahead and write this out, because it turns out that a lot of these factorials are gonna cancel. So this number is 51 factorial over three factorial, times 48 factorial, right, 51 minus 3. And that's over 52 factorial over um, 4 factorial, 48 factorial. OK. OK, so um, right. So what do we need to do? We need to flip this and multiply some stuff. So this is just arithmetic at this stage, um, arithmetic with factorials in it. But right off the bat, um, these 48 factorials are going to cancel, right? So. Fine, cool. Okay, and we saw this a little bit when we started talking about, um, well, just uh, <coughs> with factorials in general. Um, if you have something like n plus 1 factorial over n factorial, most of it's going to cancel. And you can kind of see why. So let's, let's look at it again with this 4, right? So 4 factorial is 4 times 3 times uh, 2 times 1. And then we still have a 51 factorial over here. And the 3 factorial is 3 times 2 times 1. And we had a 52 factorial down here. Right? So those guys all cancel, and you're just left with a bigger number. So the analogous thing is going to happen here, except it's the big ones on the bottom. So what we're left with is 4 over 52, which reduces to 1 over 13, which uh, I did on a calculator earlier, <laughs> um, is approximately 7.7%. All right, so Blake, how are you feeling about those cards? Are they are they pretty well shuffled? Uh, yeah. They're, you're they're you're shuffled. feeling like they're your card is lost in there, and that we're not gonna. Mm -hmm. All right, so go ahead and give them back. Um, so I'm gonna pick out four cards that I think might be uh, Blake's chosen card, and you guys can um, chat amongst yourselves while I do this. <laughs> it's gonna take a second. Um, okay, I guess that didn't take that long. All right. Uh, okay, so I think that um, card Blake chose, which I hope you guys haven't forgotten, um, is amongst these four. All right, so let's take a look. So I think it might be uh, one of these four black cards. How'd we do, guys? <laughs> Oh, everybody's nervously giggling. All right, so maybe it wasn't there. Then there's 
a 92.3% chance that that happens. <laughs> Fine. <laughs> but as promised in the email, this isn't just probability, it's magic, and now I think... scenario where normal people who don't do magic are handling cards, which is the probability of, what is the probability of four cards, again, randomly selected cards out of 52, uh, being four of a kind. Ends up being a less interesting counting problem, but I guess uh, more globally interesting. Um, so, all right, so four of a kind is something we're, we're sort of interested in, right? So, what we need again, our denominator is just going to be that same number that we had here, right? So, um, again, because we're choosing four cards, so we know this is what's going to be on the bottom. Let's write it like this, okay? And then, how about on top? How many different ways are there to choose four of a kind? Yeah. No. 13. Yeah. Right. Okay. So there's 13, right? Because there's 13 different card values, right? There's ace through 10 and jack, queen, and king. So there's 13 ways to have four of a kind because once you have your, once you pick your value, like fives, for example, you have all four of them. So it's the only way to get four of a kind. Does that make sense to you guys? So this is this number. Um, which we know is something like this. Okay, and this winds up being, again, I did this on a calculator, approximately uh, 0.0048%. So it's incredibly unlikely that um, four cards would wind up being four of a kind when randomly selected uh, from a deck. Um, then you can further you can further narrow this down and ask um, what is the probability that it's a particular form of the kind probability let's spell probability on the board probability okay um, of four aces for example so in that case there's only one way to get that the desired outcome so it's one over this big number which is approximately it's less percent. Right. Okay, so so these are relatively unlikely circumstances. So would you guys like to see a demonstration about how you could uh, find yourself in this in this scenario? Yeah. Yes. yes. I wasn't super enthusiastic. Okay. Like I kind of out of control. <laughs> All right. So here's this uh, again. This deck of playing cards, um, and we're. Uh, Interested in the aces because a lot of games use aces or whatever. Okay, um, so I'm going to go ahead and uh, take them out. Um, all right. Okay, so there they all are. All right, so um, I'm just going to show you guys this little demonstration of how of how the four aces behave under uh, certain, certain circumstances. So um, a lot of you guys probably think that the ace of spades is kind of the most important or interesting ace. Yes? No? Sure. Okay. Well, I'm going to show you guys why that's wrong. It's actually the uh, ace of hearts, which uh, I'll, I'll, you guys will see in a second why that's what I'm, okay. All right, I'm just going to do it. Okay. I'm not usually combining like a math talk with doing magic. This is like kind of a the world's collide issue. Okay, so um, let's spread these other aces around. 
And over here in the corner, we've got our uh, Ace of Hearts, which we said is particularly important. Yes, so I'm just gonna set it down on top. Try to keep an eye on that Ace of Hearts, or down, whatever you need to, need to do. Okay, here we go. So demonstration beginning. All right, so first we've got the, uh, the Ace of Spades, the one everybody thinks is so interesting and important. So let's go ahead and turn that over and just give it a little wave over that special Ace of Hearts. And I think that Ace of Spades should be... Oh. Weird, okay. Seems like a combinatorics phenomenon. Okay, all right, so let's, uh, let's, uh, let's keep this ball rolling now that we uh, know the system. So next we've got the, uh, the Ace of Diamonds. So let's just uh, turn that guy over, get rid of these, give it a little wave, and that too should have hopefully Wow. Weird. Okay, we've got one more. It's the uh, Ace of Clubs, so I'm just going to go ahead and bury it and give it a little wave. And I think if we uh, did that right, that too should be gone. That's super weird, right? But what did we talk about? What do we want? The four aces in a four card hand. So first we've got the Ace of Hearts, which we put there. And underneath it, the three other aces of point zero zero seven percent Thank you. That wasn't really a lot of math, but I just like that one. Um, I don't know if I trust Tori anymore. Thanks. That was pretty much it for, for my um, math and snacks content, especially the math content. So does anybody have any questions or comments? or? Statements about math. If no. All right. Then that that was it. Thank you. Enjoy some snacks. Hey. Oh. If you guys want to hang around, I can do another trick that has nothing to do with math. Okay. <laughs> you guys want that? All right. Okay. I'll do one more. Um. All right. I felt like I should conclude the math part. This isn't math at all. Uh. Instead, well, I guess it's kind of like um not theory? It's not. Um, uh, that wasn't a pun on dots. Okay, all right. You guys in front, I'm gonna swing this rope to you. Specifically, I'm swinging at Nathan, but you can share it with the other people in the front. Yeah, we can share it with them. Or you don't have to share it. I just want you to take a look at it and, or do whatever you need to do with it. Just, or, well, don't be too weird with it. Just, uh, just inspect the length of rope and verify that it is in fact the length of rope. It is some length of rope, yes. Okay. How long is it? <laughs> it's long. quite long. <laughs> One wingspan. <laughs> One rope length. All right. <laughs> Move back. Thank you. So you guys are satisfied that this is a uh, rope? It looks like a finger trap. It's not. It's rope. Okay. All right. So if I were to cut this rope in one place, how many pieces of rope would I get? Three. No. <laughs> Two. Two. Thank you. Or if I were to cut it in three places, how many how many pieces would that yield? Four. 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 Right. Or if I were to cut it in n places, I would get n plus one. Plus one. Very good. Okay. <laughs> That's counting. All right. So I'm gonna go ahead and cut the rope in. Don't gasp. <laughs> in two places, which we cl correctly calculated would yield three approximately equal lengths of rope. Okay, so now that I've taught you all about counting, would you like me to teach you about creating a rope illusion? Yeah. Yes. Yes. All right. God, really? You <laughs> <laughs> silence your cell phone. Sir, so you need to leave. <laughs> Thank you, Usher Edgar. <laughs> okay, Sorry. back to the Back to creating a rope illusion. So I would take one of these lengths of rope before coming to hang out with you guys at Math and Snacks and uh, fold it up in my hand like so. So if I, if I do this and fold one of these ends down uh, from the front with my hand closed up like this, it looks a lot like I have two longer pieces of rope and one shorter piece of rope, right? But you guys know secretly the rest of that short piece is balled up in my hand. Okay, 
So, but if, if you kind of wiggle the ends and squint your eyes, it's really convincing, and you'd almost believe that there actually was a shorter piece of wood. <laughs> Weird. Okay. Guys, it's conclusion. Relax. So, we can keep this going and fold one down and one up. And again, this is pretty convincing, right? It really looks like there's a short piece and a longer piece, and you'd almost think there really was a longer length of rope. <laughs> oh, okay. This is kind of a weird collection of reactions. <laughs> okay, so that's fine. I, I'm confused. That's, I mean, this is the part where you're allowed to be confused, not the accounting part. So as long as you got the math, that's fine. Okay, so we've got these uh, three equal lengths of rope that right now look kind of not equal, so that's not good. So let's um, let's go back from delusion to reality. All we have to do is give them a little tug. Little snap. Oh, I kind of like snapping. Is that weird? Okay. <laughs> well, I'll keep that to myself. <laughs> but now that we've done the little rope snap and everything, we should again have three approximately equal lengths of rope. Mm -hmm. All right, that's it, guys. I'm going to actually stop there because I want to eat snacks. But thank you for coming to hang out with me. Yeah.